Amen. Amen. So by the grace of God this morning, I shall be ministering what I titled God's plan for marriage. God's plan for marriage. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, I just bless your name this morning. I want to appreciate you for all this, your wonderful children that you have brought even to you to come and learn at your feet today. Holy Spirit, I pray shall speak to each and every one of us in the name of Jesus. I decrease that you may increase in me. And I pray, Almighty God, I shall make the heart of your children receptive even to your word in the name of Jesus. I pray that every one of us shall be blessed by your word. We shall not only be the hearers, but we shall be doers as well in the name of Jesus. And at the end, Almighty God, we shall be better, even for your word's sake, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Blessed be thy name. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Like I said, by the grace of God this morning, within the short time that we have, I'm going to be, you know, talking to us about God's plan for marriage. The text is taken from Genesis 1, from 26 to 28, and Genesis 2, 18, to 18 and 24. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. He created him. Male and female, he created them. 28. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Amen. Genesis 2, 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. May the Lord have blessings to the reading of his words in Jesus. Like I said, I'm going to be ministering on God's plan for marriage. So what's God's plan for marriage? Marriage is one of God's most beautiful gifts and is intended to bless us, to fulfill us, and to give us a path to sanctity. Understanding what true love entails and how grace works to overcome our wounded human nature is the key to a holy happy and passionate marriage. You know the word of God says, for by grace are we saved. It's not of everything that we're done. It's only by the grace and mercy of God. Christ died for our sake simply because he wants to reconcile us back to God. That is unconditional love. And that's kind of the love that God wants to see in our marriages. We are talking about Christian marriage, not just any marriage. Christ is expecting us as, as Christian couples to demonstrate the kind of love that he demonstrate for, demonstrated for us on the cross of Calvary. It is my prayer that that will be our portion, even as Christian couples, in the name of Jesus. Marriage is God's plan, and his purpose for creating man and woman and joining them in marriage was to mirror his image here on heart. God wants people to see your marriage and see his reflection in your marriage. That is the essence, the whole essence of God by bringing man and woman together. He wants people on the outside to see you and see what he looks like. He wants you to be a reflection of him. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. The Hebrew word mirror means to reflect God, to magnify, to exalt, and to glorify him. Christian marriage indeed is to reflect God's image to a world that desperately needs to see who he is. God is telling us this morning that the world needs to see and experience what a Christian marriage is for them to know who he is. People out there, they need to see you and, you know, and just see you know, what, 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 what kind of life are you living? What, what, what lesson is your marriage portraying to people out there? The unbelievers... Because that's the whole essence of God creating marriage. It's so beautiful. He wants people to see you 
and see his image. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. The current statistics about marriage in America is very sobering. The classic union, I'm just not going to go into the statistics because it's, it's just depressing. The classic union of a mother and father with their own children is becoming extinct. Some experts say the reason marriage is disintegrating is due to failure, is due to, failure to hold marriages and marriage commitment in high esteem. We just think it's just one of those things. It's sacred, brethren. But we need to know that it says it's sacred and God expects us to hold it in high esteem. It's not just one of those things. It is not what something that is convenient for you. It is a serious matter. And we need to take it as that. We need to hear, I mean, see the heart of God concerning this matter. Maybe if we do, we will not take just matters into our own hands and just think we can just do anything with marriages. If you know you are not ready for it, why go into it? The Christian family is not immune to this fallout. Most couples in our society bail out of their relationships as soon as things get difficult because they see marriage as a contract or a temporary agreement, which can easily be broken. But this isn't the way God sees marriage. According to the creator and architect of marriage, marriage is a holy covenant. Marriage is not a contract. It is an holy covenant before God. It is a serious matter. Contrary to modern thinking, marriage is not a contract between two people until lack of fulfillment or irreconcilable differences do you part. Because that's what people think. Once things get difficult, you begin to see people talk about, you know, we have irreconcilable differences. What is that? When we are talking about, when we are talking like about covenant, there's nothing like irreconcilable differences. You only have irreconcilable differences when you have, you have contact, I mean contact with one, your, 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 your fellow business partners. When you have contact with business partners, you can decide to part your ways, you part ways anytime. But when it comes to marriage, no. That is not the way the architect of marriage has designed it. It is you people, we, you know, that don't take it serious. We think that once things are hot, of course things will be difficult. In a marriage, marriage is supposed to be a lifelong thing. These are two people from different backgrounds that they come together. You don't expect that things will be okay for you, you know, every time, all the time. We need to learn to, to uh, disagree and agree. That is what marriage is all about. Even in the mouth and the, you know, they say, even in the mouth, the teeth and the tongue, they do fight. So if you bite your tongue, will you not say that the teeth, you are going to remove the teeth and take it away? No. You just have to learn to, you know, live together as one. Unless you don't want to eat meat again. Or you don't want to eat any kind of food anymore. <laughs> the Lord will help us all in Jesus' name. So marriage is a covenant which is serious, a solemn vow before God. The consequences of breaking this covenant are extraordinarily serious. Exodus 5 from, from 4 to 5 says, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Because the Bible is telling us that people that just break covenant anyhow, they are fools. May none of us be fooled in Jesus' name. So, God is expecting us to fulfill our vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. And the Bible says that God is hungry because he hates divorce. God wants against breaking a vow before, made before him. May God not be angry with us in Jesus' name. At the start of a married life, couples typically cannot imagine having to work to keep their love relationship alive. But over time, we discover that maintaining a healthy, strong marriage requires a determined effort and commitment of both parties. Marriage is work. I tell young people, marriage is work. It is commitment. You have to work at it to make it work. 
You can't just leave things to chances. You can't say because, oh, I, I fell in love with this guy. That love will clear away within a second. Yeah. Love does, I mean, just one little thing, you will forget about love. It might be love that brought us together, but it's not that same. It's not only love that will keep us together. There are several other things that will keep a marriage together to make it work. We just need to know that we need to do all these extra things to make our marriages work. Because that's what God expects of us. He wants us to work at it. He wants us to be committed. And by the grace of God, as we work on it, our marriages, and as we are committed to make it work, it will work in Jesus' mighty name. Because there is nothing that will commit into the hands of God that, you know, ever fails. Once you commit something to the hand of God and you are committed to doing it, you will see it will become, it will become actually a little bit easier. Like I said, it's not, I mean, we're not saying it's easy. This, I mean, imagine you are two different people from different backgrounds coming together at, at I mean, at sometimes at very old age, Papa, you know? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, like, we are more like uh, dry fishes, you know, like, but we just need to make it work. We need to make it work. God will help us in Jesus' name. <laughs> a godly marriage begins with love of course but there are many other ingredients that when blended together uh, leads to a happy, harmonious and lifelong marriage so what are the, some of these ingredients that we need to you know, pay attention to to make our marriages to work number one we need to nurture our friendship we need to be friends with our spouses honestly I believe that you know, marriages that really last long are people that actually start their you know, relationship on a friendly basis. Because honestly, when you are friends, before you become lovers, you tend to you know, like, enjoy each other more. You nurture each other. Because honestly, what you don't nurture will die a natural death. A little baby that is born into this world, if, you, if care is not taken and the mom does not nurture that baby, that baby will die of starvation. But this is what I'm saying, that it's very good for us to be friends with our spouses. You know, let our spouses be our korikosu. You know, the Bible makes us to understand that, you know, friends love at all times. You know, you enjoy the company of your friends. You do things with your friends. I want to enjoy us, even as enjoying us as couples, as, as you know, married couples this morning. Don't let us forget those days that we go, we take each other out on dates. Those are the, some of the ways that we can nurture our friendship. Take each other out on dates. Make it a regular, even when the kids come. Times that you need, times that needs to be your me time. Make use of it. Keep the kids with, I mean, the children with somebody else. Go out on a, out on a date. Go to the movies. Things that you used to enjoy, you continue to enjoy them because that's the way you can nurture your relationship. You don't just say because we, children have, has come, especially women. When children come, you forget your first love. This is very wrong. You need to nurture one another. Nurture that friendship so that that friendship can grow and blossom. If you do not nurture it, it's just going to die. Don't forget those things that you were doing before. God will grant us grace in Jesus' name. I believe our spouses should be our best friend. Friends disagree they, and to, to agree. How many friends do we have that you, you I mean, you, of course, you, you are mad at each other, but the next minute, because you long to see them again. You know, that's how it should be. Be friends with your spouses. Don't let your best friend be, some, be another person outside. You should not enjoy the company of somebody outside than that of your spouse. It is wrong. If you have been doing that, you know, you need to stop it. You need to stop it. Make your spouse your best friend. The Lord will help you in Jesus' name. Another ingredient of making a marriage to last the way God has designed it is commitment. A solid sense of commitment is a key to make, making marriage last forever. Marriage is more than feelings. It's a covenant like we said. Just as God is committed to loving us unconditionally, so we are committed, we are called to love our spouses unconditionally. 
Jesus is committed to loving us. We must be committed to loving our spouses unconditionally. The Bible makes us understand that when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did not have to, die, to do it. But he did. Because of that unconditional, I beg of us, men and women, under the sound of my voice, choose to love your spouses unconditionally. Be committed to loving them the way Jesus has shown us. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Another ingredient is affirmation. We need to constantly give emotional support and encouragement to one another. I know that most of us, as ladies, before we got married, most of you were probably like figure eight. Right? But once babies start to come, the Lord began to add you know, that, that special anointing. And you begin to, you know, to expand from right to left to, you know, like, everywhere. But it's interesting. Because men, for a long time, they can remain the same. But it's not the same thing as women. But those men are supposed to affirm their, you know, however those women look after giving birth to your beautiful children. You are supposed to affirm them. You are supposed to tell them they look beautiful. You are supposed to tell them you love them. You know, the other day, my husband was, uh, was out with some pastors and they were making fun. They were saying, you know, like, I think they were just comparing notes and telling each other how, uh, yeah, I love, I mean, how their wives, you know, like when they are going, it takes them time to dress up and all that, that, that. And then that the fact that, you know, some of them, you know, they put them to work to help them put on some, you know. Me, women, you know what I'm talking about? You know, because, you know, like, as women, we, it is work to make us look good after having children. Those girls need to stand right, right? It's his work. We, I mean, it's, it's all about packaging. So we may go to all this trouble to make, theirself, to make themselves attractable to these men. So those pastors, God bless them, they were complaining that they have to, you know, they, they have to do some work, help them to put the thing on. Because I tell you, that some of these things is hard to put on. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we still go through all the trouble to make sure that we are still attracted to our own men. Yes, it's work. So because you have to help us put them on and have to help us take them off because it's very hard. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm sure I have witness in the house. Why are we doing all that? It's to make ourselves attractive, attractive to our men. You know, just to please them. We don't have to do it. But we want to make sure everything is in the proper, you know, proper shape, proper, you know. Lord have mercy. So men, please, appreciate us. Tell us you love us. Regardless of what where we look, amen. Hallelujah. So, please, husband, let's always affirm our wives, compliment them on their looks, and make them feel good. Honestly, you know, this thing I mean, we're joking about it, but it can be very depressing to women. You want to be attractive, but sometimes, you know, like, you know. But we don't want to do it. I mean, like, we sometimes it's, but just help us anyhow. Help us to do the work. Amen. Amen. Another ingredient is we need to be quick to forgive. A strong, godly marriage is quick to forgive. Unforgiveness can create a shaky foundation in a relationship. Forgiveness is the key, is a key ingredient that moves someone from beyond brokenness and towards healing when conflict arises. Honestly, we will, for, we, we, we will offend one another. There's no way. We will definitely offend one another. But we must be quick to forgive. It is important. Do not let us have an unforgiving spirit. It is not good. And it's not of God. When the disciples asked Jesus, how often should they forgive? He says 70 times 70. That's even in a day. Oh. 70 times 7 times in a day. That's like 490. Can somebody be as bad as wicked or devilish to offend somebody in 490 times in a day? 
it's not possible. But the essence is just that no matter how many times we offend one another, as couples, we must be quick to forgive. Don't let us hold offenses in our hearts. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Another ingredient is handling conflict. Disagreements and conflicts are inevitable in a marriage. One sign of a godly marriage isn't whether you argue, but how you undo it when it happens. Couples who learn to disagree in an agreeable and respectful manner grow in strength. We as, as Christian couples, we must learn to disagree and ag agree in a very respectable manner. We must learn to respect one another. I know men, they will say men, the, what they desire most is for women to respect them. Honestly, we love to respect, but it's also, I believe, is reciprocal too. Men, I mean, women, ordinarily women will want to respect their husband, but we need to be, we also want to be respected as well. You know, you don't expect us to respect you when you, do, you look down on us, you talk to us like you're, you know, like you're slave in the house. I'm not saying those of you here do that, but you know, I'm just saying that we just need to respect one another. God will grant us the grace in Jesus' name. Also, we need to stay humble. Pride and arrogance do not make a godly marriage, but humility does. Humility is an ingredient for a peaceful home and it unifies spouses. The Bible in Ephesians 4, 2 to 3 says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Let us be humble. Do not let, not let us be, be prideful. No, do not let us be proud and haughty. God hates the, the, the prideful person, but he gives grace to the humble. Let us be humble in our homes. The Lord will grant us grace in Jesus' name. Also, another ingredient is having a servant's heart. Having a servant's heart. Godly, godly couples should have a servant's heart. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. Having a servant's heart in the home means you are looking first to the need of your spouse even before yourself. A servant's heart. You know, Jesus taught us about washing the feet of his disciples. He was the master. But it's too so low to wash the feet of his disciple. That was a lesson for us. So as couples, I want us to look to the need of your spouse first. Look at what the needs of your spouse is before yourself. That is having a servant's heart. Prefer your spouse to yourself. It's not so difficult. Because I tell us, if we you know, in a relationship, we're always thinking of the other person first. There's, there's, no, there's no way the other person will not also do the same for you. You watch out for one another. It is very important. What you do, you get back. The seed you sow will come back to you. You don't expect, you, when you don't sow something, you don't expect, you should not expect it back. If you don't think about your spouse first, only yourself, yourself, yourself. I mean, you, you, I mean, it's just, it's just going to be an ingrate or somebody that's not reasonable that would think, okay, I'm all about myself. It's all about me and me and me and me. And you expect the other party to always succumb, to always do what you want. If the person has been doing it, it's going to, going to go to a point that he or she will have a think, rethink and say, ah, am I momo in this, in this relationship? I mean, we just need to just we just need to just put ourselves in each other's shoes and see what other people are feeling. Put yourself in your spouse's shoes. How does it feel to be in your spouse's shoe for one day? I think if we, if we try to do that, then maybe we'll know the effect of you know our actions on the other party. God will grant us grace in the name of Jesus. Amen. Understanding. Oh, I'm, time is almost. Marriage is a blend of two very different people who choose to match their lives and create a home together. It's very important for us to try to understand each other. Let us practice empathy. Do we know what empathy is? I think that's what I just talked about, putting yourself in other person's shoes. 
Let's practice empathy in our marriages. Seeing situations from our spouse's angle will help us as we walk towards understanding one another. Also, unity is an ingredient in making our marriage to last the distance. In a marriage, husbands and wives are supposed to be on on the same team. Two people on the same team who have chosen to be joined together as one. Remember, it was your choice to be married to that guy anyway. I, I know that, that some, in some cultures, they do arrange marriages. But is there anybody under the sound of my voice today that somebody actually arranged your marriage for you? Is there anybody? So it was your choice. You took your eyes to the market before you picked that lady. Pastor Dele? Absolutely. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so it was your choice to choose that partner. It is very important that we live together in unison. Unity does not, doesn't mean that we have to agree on everything or have all the same preferences, likes, and dislikes. Unity doesn't say that. You don't have to agree on everything. You don't have to have the same preferences. You don't have to have the same dislikes. You don't have to have the same likes. But instead... It means sticking together in spite of our differences. That is what unity is all about. In spite of our differences, we choose to stay together. We are committed to one another. In spite of those differences. Because we made that initial choice to become man and wife. So despite all the differences in us, we different. Even, I mean, even as parents, as mothers, some of us that have one, two, three kids, are they all the same? You wonder, there are some children, you tell them, sit down there, they will sit down. And another, it does not matter. <laughs> you'll be chasing them all around, and you'll be like, am I the same? Am I, did I give back to you? They're just different. You know? So the same with us as adults. We even actually got to know one another as adults. So we have differences. That's what they call natural nature. We are products of our background, you know, and things that shape from us. So when we now come together as husband and wife, those differences will still be there. But in spite of those differences, let us always agree together. Because it's our choice to be husband and wife. Remember, we are raising kids and we have to model godliness. We have to model to them that we are a reflection of the glory of God. Some people, I mean, you talk to some young adults, they they are scared of marriage because of what they saw in their parents. May that not be our portion in Jesus' mighty name. God is depending on us to model his grace, his glory to the children that we are raising. Let us learn to talk to one another in the home with respect with humility, with grace. You don't talk to your spouse anyhow. I'm talking to both men and women. With grace, with respect, you talk to your spouse. The Lord will grant us grace in Jesus' name. So it's a conscious decision to work together to reach consensus, compromising when necessary as you make decisions together, both big and small. Let us learn to make decisions together. Don't let us make decisions outside of our spouses. No matter how small those decisions are or no matter how big, we must learn to make decisions together. God will help us in Jesus. I know that some of us, our marriages have been quite some, you know, like maybe 20, 30 years, you know, like maybe we think we can change. But with God, all things are possible. If there's something you have been doing that has not been working, maybe it's time for you to change. It's time for us to change. And we, we need to change because of God. Because honestly, the plan and purpose of God is for her marriage to reflect his glory. It's to reflect, to be a mirror of his image. Who does God look like to you? Think about it. Is, is your marriage a reflection of God's glory? I pray we will not fail God in this regard in Jesus' name. In conclusion, 
our marriages are to be working examples of God's unending love, his grace, and his mercy. It should be, actually, before, before actually, like, okay, no, I'm going. It should, be, it should bring glory to God and point outsiders who are looking in to a loving and redeeming God. I'll take that again. Our marriages should bring glory to God and point outsiders, those that are not yet married, and those unbelievers. It should point them to a loving and redeeming God. That's why God wants our marriages to reflect his glory. So that people will see him in you, in your marriage. People can know God through our marriages. I, I know that's, that seems a little, you know, big. But if you can't do it, God will not have expected it from us. It's his expectation. And we can do it because we are his children. Remember, we're talking about Christian marriage. It's not just any marriage out there. God wants us to enjoy our relationships, have peace in them, raise godly children, and be good role models for the younger ones to emulate. We must therefore make deliberate efforts to live together in accordance with God's word in Ephesians 5 from 22 to 25, which says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Men, I want to beg us. Let us love our wives unconditionally. It's important. No matter what, truth thick and thin. Let us love our wives. And honestly, if you really love your wife, I tell you, if you tell them to jump, they will just ask you how high. But you have to be committed to them. Your love has to be unconditional. It shouldn't be dependent on what they do or do not do. Because you are the head. God has made you the head. And a man should lead the way in the home. The way you want your house to be, your family to be, men are supposed to take the lead. I tell you, it is what you do. Your wife will follow suit. They will follow you. All we want is love. We want love. Every woman wants love. Is it respect that men wants? Who will respect you? Honestly, it will be easy. It will be easy. But you take the lead. Take the lead. The Lord will help us all in Jesus' name. It is my prayer this morning that our homes shall reflect heaven, even here or not, in Jesus' name. Let us rise up. Almighty and everlasting Father, we just bless your name this morning. Thank you, Father, for your word that you have sent even unto us as your sons and daughters. I pray, Almighty God, that indeed every word that you have caused me to speak this morning, I pray, Almighty God, it shall have an impact in every heart that has had in the mighty name of Jesus. But adventure, there is any marriage that is not the way it should be at this time. Holy Spirit, intervene in the name of Jesus. Everything that you expect of us, as man, as woman, the grace to do it, grant unto us in the name of Jesus. May none of us add in, add in our hearts to your word. In the name of Jesus. We pray that even from today, by adventure we have not been doing it. That from today, our marriage is by choice, by being committed, by loving unconditionally, it shall begin to reflect your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. That people on the outside will look in and see the glory of God that is in our home in the name of Jesus. Amen. And that people 
will want to be like us. In the name of Jesus. Every single one of us that you have called as your children. You have expectations of us. May none of us foil you. In the name of Jesus. The grace that we need. To be that godly husband. To be that godly woman. Father grant unto all your children. In the name of Jesus. Every plan of the enemy. To make our marriages to fail. We come against it. In the name of Jesus. And we declare that it's well with our homes. In the name of Jesus. I want to seize this opportunity to remember those our younger ones. Believing you for the bone of their bone and the flesh of their flesh. Almighty God, I pray that even in this year of divine connection, you will divinely connect them in the name of Jesus. Their season will not pass them by. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. Blessed be thy name, O Lord. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hallelujah.